Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Tucky, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney Magic. Whether they be singers, actors, Imagineers, animators, they have all made their mark on the Disney name. Be sure to check out the show notes, other episodes, contests, our social media pages from Facebook to Twitter, and more on our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, actor Bradley Pierce, to the show. Welcome, Bradley. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Thanks for joining us. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. Let's start talking about your beginnings in acting. You know, did you start in theater first and move and moved on to auditions for films? Um, well, I actually started out with uh, commercials. Was my my foyer into it? Um, I came through uh, from Arizona when I was about six years old with the goal of just trying to act because I enjoyed doing it and luckily I had a family that was very supportive of it and we came out here and after a few weeks I booked my first job which was a McDonald's commercial um, for the Little Mermaid Happy Meal toys actually and I was uh, squirting a uh, squeezing flounder and using him to squirt Ursula and it was a lot of fun and so I did just commercials for the first um, I'd say six months or so, and then I moved into doing some TV like guest spots and um, things like that where I'm on a series one time, and then I moved uh, into trying to do some film. Uh, voice work was how I officially got my SAG card. Um, I did a Hallmark TV animated series. Uh, I can't remember what it was called, but I was a series of... Uh, old stories and fables, and I was a boy in uh, Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, I was the one who announced to everyone that he was not wearing any clothes. Um, And then, not too long after that, I auditioned for Beauty and the Beast, but it was almost a year before I heard back and officially was cast. Little Mermaid kind of started this wave of the Disney renaissance, as they call it, and it was followed by, of course... Beauty and the Beast. And so Beauty and the Beast, I'm going to guess, so many changes. An animated film just goes through so many changes. The entire process was actually almost three years for the shoot. Um, the really interesting part of it is Chip started out as only having one line. Uh, and it was the mama, there's a girl in the castle. That was the only line that Chip had. And the rest of the uh, interaction that ended up being Chip's role was going to be a music a music box, excuse me, that just played chimes. Uh, But yeah, like you said, they tested it and they realized that there wasn't really any child character, any any way for children to relate to the story, which that doesn't work for Disney. You You have to get kids involved and connected and engaged with your story in order for it to be successful. So they added a few more chip lines. Um, uh, And then there was, see, I told you, uh, I told you she was pretty mama, didn't I? And one other one, I can't remember, but it went up to four and then nothing for a few months. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, let's bring you in and do a few more and then nothing. And then they started, they did a full script uh, rewrite where they added in the character and gave him all kinds of scenes and lines. And it worked out really, really well for me. And it's approaching its 25th anniversary, which is just unbelievable. You know, 25 years ago, 1991, it doesn't seem that long ago. And uh, at the same time of the premiere, I thought you would find this interesting, of the film, uh, Disney premiered its first real stage show of an animated film in uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios at Walt Disney World, and they also did one in Disneyland. That show still has your voice. After 25 years, you are still featured in the theme parks as as Chip, and I just find that so fascinating. Have you ever gotten a chance to see the show and, and, and hear yourself as a young kid? Um, I have not seen the theme park version of the show. Um, I have seen the national tour of the show a few times. But, uh, yeah, it's, 
it's interesting the way they did that, and they used um, the original character voices for lifts and for some of the parts, but then for uh, some of the singing and things like that, um, they you know obviously are the characters on stage, which is really a lot of fun. Beauty and the Beast is built for Broadway. It's got the right kind of scope. Uh, it's got the right kind of songs and music that can get everybody um, singing along. So I feel like um, of all of the Disney movies, I feel like Beauty and the Beast was the one that really fit for that transition into staged theatrical production. So years passed after Beauty and the Beast, and I had no idea until I started researching a little bit further, but another, uh, one of the only sequels that Disney made that really made it to the big screen was Return to Neverland, and you voiced Nibs in this. So how old were you around that time and, and working with such a big cast? Because I did get to interview the voice of Peter Pan a while ago, and, they, and he said you guys had a big recording session for that one song in the film. These are the things that Lost Boys do. Yes, um... Actually, I think that's the only time um, that I am on, that I've been recorded singing. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was interesting because with Beauty and the Beast, for the most part, um, we all recorded separately. And again, I didn't have any songs in the original uh, Beauty and the Beast. I didn't record with other people very often. I think I had one session with Angela, but other than that, it was all... I'd record my pieces and they would come in and record theirs. Uh, with Return to Neverland, it was very different because we had generally all of the Lost Boys in the room at the same time, going back and forth, bantering with the lines, and then we would uh, go in and if we had a line that needed to pick up, we would just do that one. We had Peter, uh, we had um, Jane, uh, and all the Lost Boys. So there was uh, eight of us in the room, not including the voice directors, going back and forth for the music. It was a lot of fun. We have recently had uh, somebody on the show who is a director of this short film that featured Walter Cronkite and Robin Williams. And this was the introduction for Robin into the Disney industry. Uh, it was a short film called Back to Neverland. And this is why I wanted to tie it in because this was the first time that Peter Pan had been reintroduced to a new generation. And I just find it amazing because, again, for listeners who do not know, uh, Bradley, you were in Jumanji, and that, and the fact that you were in Return to Neverland, which was another reintroduction to Neverland and Peter Pan and the Lost Boys, working with Robin on Jumanji, you know, you both had worked on a Disney film. Did you ever discuss that that topic? N not really in detail. We did talk a little bit about um, the the way he used his characterizations in that, uh, just because that's the way his personality was. It, he did live the way Jeannie does in a way in that he's so big and so boisterous and the characters and he'll transition from being just the normal guy to being, you know, the, the gobby the creature to all the different characters as he's going through, which was a lot of fun to watch. I was unaware of that uh, tie-in with Walter Cronkite and the Neverland Project. But um, one of my first uh, voiceover jobs, uh, actually not one of my first, it was a few years after I'd started, but I did uh, called Background Voices or Group Looping, um, and I voiced the Lost Boys in the movie Hook. That was the first background uh, voice work that I had ever done. And it happened to be on Hook with Robin. It, it's interesting because as diverse and busy as Robin's career was, there's, there's a few points where everything seems to come together. Um, and Aladdin was one of them. Uh, and uh, there were a few others. Doubtfire was another one where he had worked with a lot of these people in different venues before and finally got together. But it's really interesting... Uh, how that works and his career was amazing he was an amazing man and there's these points that you can identify where he transitioned um, as a performer and as a person from uh, one level of his career to another first of all let me ma let me make sure I open up the opportunity for you to plug any of your upcoming projects because you were a producer and you've been working on certain films, including Blind and Deacon. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the job behind the camera as opposed to being in front of the camera? 
a few years ago, um, almost four years ago now, uh, a friend of mine, J. Paul Zimmerman, who uh, your Disney fans will know from Halloween, the Halloween Town series, he, uh, he approached me. He wanted to start a production company that specialized in science fiction, and um, he wanted to see if I could help him out with that. And so, okay, we talked about it, and we figured out that we can try to do event coverage. So we do, do coverage at things like Comic-Con, um, Kamikaze, uh, Long Beach, and Phoenix um, Comic Cons as well, uh, and you know horror events like Days of the Dead. Um, so we do a lot of press coverage of those, and that's all uh, put up onto our YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com/zfonline. Um, the company that we created is called ZFO Entertainment, and you can get to that at uh, ZFOEntertainment.com. Um, so that's the company, and we, in addition to doing press and media coverage for geek events, we also are producing some originals. Um, our first short film we are finishing up editing on now, and it's called Vultures, um, but we're hoping to have it out for summertime of this year. I also just started my own blog, blog, uh, and that's on my channel, which is youtube.com slash Bradley Pierce. Also, I'm on all the different social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and it's uh, at Mr. Bradley Pierce. And we will make sure we include all the links to all of your social media accounts and the websites below in the show notes so our listeners can go ahead and check them out and uh, stay in touch with you because I'm sure there's going to be plenty more questions after our interview that I did not get to, and listeners will be able to send your way. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, before we end, I want to end with our Fab Three questions that we always ask our Disney guests. So we'll start with the Donald one, which is, as a child, what Disney film was one of your favorites to see in the movie theater? Um, One of my favorite Disney movies of all time, um, and I'm fairly certain I saw it in theaters at least once, uh, was The Lion King, is The Lion King. I feel like it was, you mentioned the Disney Renaissance, and I feel like it was the, the third and really kind of the end of that particular chapter of Disney's history. Um, It was Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Lion King. And I feel like Lion King was probably, in my opinion, the best of those three films. And our goofy question, what Disney character, besides the ones you have played in the past, do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? That's kind of a tough one. Um, But... I think I think I'd like to hang out with the Mad Hatter. I don't know how good of friends we would be, but I think we I think I'd like to hang out with him at some point because um, he seems like a fun and interesting kind of character. And finally, our Mickey question: If I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? Love is an open door from Frozen. Um, because my wife was singing it with my daughter yesterday. Well, I have to thank you so much for coming on the show, Bradley. This was such a treat, and what are the odds that I'd be speaking with you now? So it really is an honor to speak with you today. Well, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Yes, you are. No, I'm not.